Now, what about catalysis? How does catalysis get involved in nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions? Well, typically either an acid or a base catalyst is used. And the general principles that we've already seen for the involvement of Bronsted acids and bases in catalysis still apply here. The key principle for acids is that acids activate electrophiles. A Bronsted acid engages with the electrophile to make it more electrophilic or more positively charged. And so just thinking about nucleophilic addition, we can see that the role of a Bronsted acid catalyst when nucleophilic addition is involved, and this is true actually whether we're dealing with ketone, aldehyde, or carboxylic acid derivative, the role of an acid catalyst, something like H3O+, is to protonate the carbonyl oxygen. The acid engages with the electrophile, the carbonyl compound, to make it stronger, converting the neutral carbonyl group into a protonated carbonyl group. And now, as you might imagine, think about the alternative resonance structure with positive charge on the carbonyl carbon. This carbon is a very strong electrophile. And that just makes the subsequent addition by the neutral nucleophile all the easier since we're avoiding the formation of separated positive and negative charges now that we've protonated the carbonyl oxygen. And now to generate the product and regenerate the catalyst, we simply give the proton, which now resides on the nucleophilic atom, back to the conjugate base of the catalyst here, water. This gives the product of nucleophilic addition and regenerates the catalyst, which was H3O+. Now, before we move forward, it's worth emphasizing this general mechanistic pattern, because we're going to see it a lot in acid-base catalysis. First, a proton transfer occurs. It's to the electrophile, since we're using an acid catalyst in this context. And then, what I call the business takes place, nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond, and that's facilitated by the protonation, since that makes the electrophile stronger. And then at the end, to regenerate the catalyst, there's a proton transfer in the opposite direction. I had a professor in undergrad who described this as a dance. Proton on, something happens, proton off, kick. Proton on, something happens, proton off, kick. That repeated cycle of proton transfer, the business, and then a proton transfer in the opposite direction is the essence of acid-base catalysis. When thinking about how bases get involved, the key is that bases activate nucleophiles. Proton transfer still occurs first, but now the proton transfer is a deprotonation of the nucleophile. So here, instead of engaging with the electrophilic carbonyl compound, of course, the base, let's just say hydroxide is acting as a specific base catalyst in this case, gets involved with the nucleophile and deprotonates it to make the nucleophile stronger. We've gone from a neutral nucleophile H nu to an anionic nucleophile nu minus, Clearly, the anionic nucleophile is more electron-rich and more nucleophilic than the starting neutral nucleophile. Now that we've activated the nucleophile toward addition to the carbonyl compound, the second step, the business, AD sub N, has been facilitated, right? And so the nucleophilic addition then occurs. This gives a tetrahedral oxyanion intermediate, and this can deprotonate the conjugate acid of the basic catalyst, here just water, and this generates the product of nucleophilic addition and regenerates the catalyst. And so once again, we see this pattern of proton transfer first, now it's proton off, then the business, and then a proton on to regenerate the catalyst at the end. And the key there is that bases activate nucleophiles. Bases deprotonate the nucleophile to make it stronger. Nucleophilic addition is just the first half of an acylation reaction. What about beta elimination? Well, acid and base catalysis also apply here. First, let's take a moment to recall the uncatalyzed process. In an uncatalyzed beta elimination, we have electron flow like this coming from a non-bonding lone pair on typically oxygen in the context of nucleophilic acyl substitution of a carbonyl group. And then the CX bond breaks toward X, where X is some decent nucleophage or leaving group. Catalyzed versions of this step involve either the oxygen, deprotonating this oxygen in the case of a basic catalyst, or protonating the leaving group in the case of an acidic catalyst. So for example, when an acid catalyst is involved, the idea is that the acid protonates the electrophilic portion. And now, if we think about beta elimination, the electrophile in beta elimination, the thing that ultimately accepts electrons, is X. 
The protonation of X, the addition of a proton H plus to the X atom, makes it a much better electrophile. Really, more precisely, we can say that HX plus is a much better leaving group than neutral X, since we'll end up with a neutral HX molecule after this bond breaks toward X, rather than an X minus anion. For this reason, the protonation of X facilitates beta elimination. Now, electron flow like this, rather than generating O plus and X minus, just generates an O plus. So we have no separation of charges as we would in the uncatalyzed mechanism, for example, that we saw at the beginning. So the products here now are the protonated carbonyl compound and the neutral HX. And to regenerate the catalyst, well, we do exactly what we did in the nucleophilic addition case. We simply transfer a proton back to the conjugate base of the catalyst now. And so we now deprotonate the protonated carbonyl compound. This gives the product and at the same time regenerates the acid catalyst, H3O+. Proton on to the leaving group in this case. The business occurs, beta elimination, proton off to regenerate the catalyst and generate the neutral product. What about base catalysis? Well, bases activate nucleophiles. So if we're starting from a neutral tetrahedral intermediate, like we see right here, the base is going to get involved with the atom that serves as the nucleophile or electron source in a beta elimination. And that's this oxygen, which is going to become the carbonyl oxygen. And so the way a basic catalyst gets involved is through deprotonation of that OH group in the context of nucleophilic acyl substitution anyway. So for example, if hydroxide is our basic catalyst, it will deprotonate the oxygen in the first step. This generates an anionic tetrahedral intermediate. And this facilitates beta elimination, this deprotonation, because now the oxygen is a much stronger electron source or nucleophile. And so rather than generating O plus and X minus, now we're just generating X minus. Again, there's no separation of formal positive and negative charges. So after the business occurs, we're left with now actually the neutral carbonyl compound. This just is the product. And we also have X minus and H2O around the conjugate acid of the catalyst. And to regenerate the original basic catalyst, which was hydroxide, X minus deprotonates it like so. So this is a little bit funky in that we've generated the product without needing to use proton transfer to make it. But that proton transfer is still key to think about, right? Because this is what actually turns over the catalyst and enables this OH minus molecule to engage in another round of beta elimination. Putting our previous discussions of catalysis and equilibrium and thermodynamics together, the thing to realize is that at the center of a nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism, we have a tetrahedral intermediate that contains two potential leaving groups, two potential nucleophuges. The X atom that was present in, say, the original substrate, and the new atom that was part of the nucleophile that added depending on the relative stabilities of HX and H nu, we may move forward to products if, for example, X minus is more stable than nu minus, or backward to starting materials if nu minus is more stable than X minus. And if the backwards direction is thermodynamically favored, it's difficult or very often impossible to generate a synthetically useful amount of the substituted product. So we need to consider the thermodynamics and the equilibrium properties of nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions. That's really the main point of this slide. Whenever you're thinking about using a nucleophilic acyl substitution in a synthesis or drawing the mechanism of a reaction that might involve a nucleophilic acyl substitution within it, consider the favored side and make sure that the favored side is the one that you want or need, as the case may be, to be the favored side. Make sure your desired products are on the favored side of a nucleophilic acyl substitution process.